Hey, what's up, everybody? This is comedian Mark Vieira, and you're listening to the Breeze Shooters podcast. Let's go. I, I might just pull like a face ray in the back with a bitch spot. Yo, welcome back, everybody. Welcome back, everybody, to the Breeze Shooters podcast show. I'm your host, Lou, joined by my good friend, El Papa. El Papa. El Papa. He, he's pulling out the shirt after Ramadan. You know, I respect, I respect. And um, anyway, your, we yours are... sounded harder than mine. <laughs> Pause. <laughs> and we are the Breeze Shooters Podcast Show. Today, big guest, Chris. Big time. Excited. I'm big excited. Time. The Prince of Comedy, Mr. Mark Vieira himself. We're going to get it. Vieira. Vieira. Bronx, Viera. Bronx, New York, Rican. Uh, what can I say? He's just a comics comic, man. He's the, if you ever see this guy online or if you ever seen him in person, and I actually saw him three times in person, the guy kills his material kills. He's very relatable to, to all people of all walks of life. But, uh, if you're Latin, you would definitely appreciate him even more because those stories hit home. But I'm really excited to have him on. So we're gonna, me and Chris are going to chop it up, chop it up with him, and we're going to talk about his start comedy game, what projects he has going on. So it should be a very entertaining show. And with that being said, Papa, how's everything, man? How you doing? Everything is good, man, and life is good. And 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 but 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 I, I've been wanting to run something by you. Okay. Um, we, I know we have laws dilemma. Laws Shout out to Laura Khan. Yeah. And I want a segment. I want two segments, actually. This guy. Um, this guy he's never, he's not happy just being on the show. Being, he sees Law Law has a segment and this fucker wants to cut in. He's like Joe Pesci. I want in. <laughs> I want a piece of the action. <laughs> My guy calls me up. He's like, Law, I got a dilemma. He's like, I was out. I run into my boy. He's with his chick. Chick comes over to me and she's like, oh, I love your coat. He goes, I can't lie. He goes, I felt a little violated by that. He goes, he goes, I think she's trying to smash. He's like, I need to know your take on it, a female's perspective. I said, guy, listen, some females are just very touchy-feely like that. Doesn't mean that they want to smash. But as a guy, I totally understand where you're coming from. Me, if I'm admiring something and I touch it, I'm not trying to fuck you, all right? You're getting way ahead of yourself. But anyway, I need to know men, women, weigh in on this topic. Is she looking Is she looking to smash if she's all in this coat or is she admiring it? Drop a comment. What's really tickling my fancy. Oh, tickling I gotta reach out to my to my white audience. I found out I found out yesterday I got white audience. <laughs> What's up, Mark? <laughs> oh god. He covers he covers two very large demographics. He covers the yeah. Italians and the Jews. Yeah, listen, yeah, that's listen, all I need. As a fact, all I need is the Jews. You yeah. can stay with everything else. Yeah. <laughs> uh two things. Uh-huh. It just hit me now. First of all, uh uh um Getting great feedback on our Nike uh, reboot commercial. Shit. I'm waiting. I'm waiting for Charles Barkley to hit me up. I, I listen, Aaron a, I'm like today. Today's the day. Today's the day. They, 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 the playoffs. Uh, they're gonna. They're gonna. They, they're gonna. Uh, they gotta have games today on TNT. So, uh, uh, great feedback on that. Another thing that I wanted to say uh, today. You put out a. Uh, 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 notice that we weren't going to be recording uh, live. Um, I don't know if you're trying to uh, hit a specific demographic of people, but you sounded I the way I saw it is that you you were trying to sound sexy. Hey, people, you know today we're not gonna like just like that. Like like you were like, you were trying to be like Al Green. Like yeah, people, you know you know not not angry, Barry White. Today we're not gonna do it from the thing, you know so. Thank you for listening. So I so I'm ju- I just wanted to bring that out. Just just talk normal, Lou, because it that creeps was, people out. Chris, that was the radio voice. That's called Wolfman Jack. 
70s. Great, oh, that's what it great, is. Great, great disc jockey. <laughs> now, ladies, cats and dogs. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna interrupt our regular programming. <laughs> hey, um, I, I don't know what's going on here, Chris. Two times already. I don't. I'm about to throw the Puerto Rican flag. You know how that goes, Chris. <laughs> Fuck it, <laughs> Chris. You know how, to, Chris. Let's see if it works. You think I should try, it, Chris? You gotta, do it. No, 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 no. Do you think I should try? Last time. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't know what's going it on, it ladies and gentlemen, if you don't know what's going on. <laughs> A long time ago, we had the rapper Cuban Link on the show, but it was a fucking, it, it was an effort. It, it took a lot of effort, mainly on my side. So Chris was like, yo, like, uh, what's going on? And then I kind of, I lift the curtain. I said, look, Chris, this is the communication. This is what I've been doing. And Chris asks me, why so many Cuban flags? Because <laughs> anytime the conversation got stale, I'll throw the flag and all of a sudden he'll, he'll converse with me. <laughs> Chris was like, get the fuck out of here. That shit don't work. So me and Cuban were going back and forth. And then the, like usual, this went over for like a fucking month. Me and Chris jumped on like about three Zoom calls that never materialized. And then I, I, I stopped the, the Cuban flag thing for a while. And then one day I said, Chris, I'm going to just throw the flag. And Chris was desperate at this point. He said, fuck it, throw the flag. Throw the flag. Cubans, boom! Yeah, fellas, I'll jump on tomorrow. And then, boom, it played out. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's see if the Puerto Rican flag carries as much weight as the Cuban flag. Here we go. Oh, it definitely carries the worth weight, but the throw it, throw it. It all depends on, on, on the recipient. Just real quick, uh, oh, got, man, got, just, just, just <laughs> put the Puerto Rican flag and then put the Bronx behind it or something like that. Oh, nice. I wish I could do that. So let me hit him with the Puerto Rican flag. Boom. Ran into Sharif and, and, and his lovely wife, Mana. Shout out to them. And shout Shafiq, out to the... Shafiq or Sharif? Shafiq. Shafiq. Okay. Shafiq uh, uh, ran into uh, him and... Uh, um, happy... Wife? happy ha Yeah, his wife. Happy Eid. Uh, happy holidays to our, uh, our brothers and, and our Good. communities out there. Our Muslim Muslims. Brothers. Muslims, yeah. Um, <laughs> Ramadan's no joke, man. I mean, it's, I do Ram. I do Ramadan all the time. <laughs> you know, it's more, it's more. It's more than fasting. It's the praying. It's you know. Oh, you you gotta pray. You gotta pray. Yeah, I, that, I, that, that, that's how it works. That's how it works. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I don't even uh, blessings, right? You would say blessings, happy holidays. Yeah, happy holiday um, blessings. Yeah. No, but uh, I don't know the meaning of that's the thing. I, I feel a little bit stupid because I don't know the me. I know that after Ramadan, 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 you just said Ramadan. Hey, it's Ramadan. <laughs> you, after Ramadan, thinking about your cancer culture, you, it might be coming for you. <laughs> I'm like, um, why is this guy talking? <laughs> <laughs> they celebrate Eid, so uh, uh, I want. If it's, it's it's like a religious, uh, to your knowledge, is it a religious? Uh, I believe it's a religious holiday because. Yo, Chris, I am. You you heard my church stories. I don't know what to do. I almost I got busted by the that, church police. I I understand that, but we uh, as 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 the the least that we can do is is. Uh, do our research regarding these different religions that you know. I, I, I'm the type of person that I want to, you know. Oh, hello, Mark's gonna jump in. He's gonna jump in. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, it worked! It worked! <laughs> it worked! Yes, <laughs> the Puerto Rican flag. <laughs> no, no, he didn't pop up yet, but he said I'm here. Um, no, um, fucker, you're the one asking the question. You do the research, so you're 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 just creating work. No, I understand that, Lewis, but you just said that, you know, yeah, yeah. like we're gonna, you, we're, you we're lied. Gonna, you, we're going we're gonna to pause that. We're going to pause that because you know, you're, you're a fool. You're going to bring up a question and then tell me, hey, we should do our due diligence to find out what, what's the meaning or what's behind because, it. Yeah, because you don't know either, Lewis. No, but I, I'm not interested. I'm not the one asking the question. We, we, but, we should, but we should be interested. Man, you're lucky Mark's coming on or else... <laughs> Mark, what's going on, brother? <laughs> you should yo, be yo, what's going on? <laughs> Come with that, Mark. Mark, tell me, tell I'm me that. Good. What's up, everybody? How we doing? 
Good, good. Mark, tell me good, that good, Puerto good. Rican flag that I text you was like the bat signal that you were like, all right, <laughs> shit, I got to go. It, it, it's showtime. It's showtime. It's showtime. I saw it in the sky and I was like, yo, got to get to it. Got to get to work. <laughs> and then I backed it up with the Bronx. I said, come on, man. He sees the X. He got to come out. I, yo, they need me. They need me. <laughs> Oh, yeah, Papa, we were drowning here. I said, where's Mark? Where's Mark? <laughs> I'm here. Now. So, I'm here. What's up, everybody? Mark, Mark, it got so bad, we started talking about religion. And that never goes well. <laughs> not, not, yeah, yeah. Not, not, you were staring at each other. What do we do? What do we do? <laughs> That's exactly what happened. <laughs> well, Mark, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Lou. Uh, my buddy here, this is Chris. And uh, we are the Breeze Shooters Podcast. And it's a true pleasure to have you on the show today. Man, can't tell you... Huge fan, huge fan. And um, I guess let's start off with, is it safe to still do stand-up comedy considering what happened to Chris Rock and uh, the whole Will Smith situation? Um, it's always safe to do stand-up comedy, man. It's not the first nor the last, um, you know, confrontation between stand-up comic and audience member. The difference is, is that I'm assuming that Will Smith felt that, you know, I guess we all know that celebrities feel more entitled to express themselves in a way that they feel like it because that's what they get paid for, okay. you know? And so I think in that moment, obviously a, a poor judgment on the side of Will Smith, not a poor joke on the side of Chris Rock because a joke is a joke is a joke. Plus Chris Rock had about six to seven writers I think, you know, I think it was a kill the messenger sort of situation, yeah. whether 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 Chris Rock went off script or not uh, for the joke still did, didn't make. You know what I mean? It's like it's like, you know, I mean, we're used to it. You know, this is the thing. I know Chris Rock is used to anything. I just didn't think he was prepared for Will Smith to make such a bad judgment. You can tell he wasn't ready, but no, no, it was no. just one of those things where you're like, damn, bro. Like you yeah. could tell Chris Rock was just not expecting that of a Will Smith. You, yeah. you understand what I mean? Like to take it so street, to take it so gully, as we say, so ratchet mm -hmm. as to expose himself in the most vile manner to, to, you know, to do that at the Oscars. I don't think Chris Rock was expecting it. Do I think Chris Rock always expects it? Always. Well, he's a stand-up comic. He does shows at the Comedy Cellar where the audience is right in his face. They're not even a foot away. He's always expecting it. He's not expecting it from Will Smith. He's not expecting it at the Oscars. And again, you know, there's always still a percentage of me that says that could have been some some shit they drew up at the in the drawing board backstage, you know? A lot of people are saying that. But you, you know what's crazy, though? Um, uh, with that whole situation, Will was laughing. So I know Chris is making eye contact, so you're thinking... All right, my joke is landing. You know, I'm getting he's reciprocating, but all of a sudden it changed and it just shows you the power of the wife. You know, she, hey, it was not yeah. that funny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you believe, if you believe 100 percent that it wasn't contrived, you know, I don't I, I never take anything at face value. There's always some stuff that happens backstage. You know, Chris Rock is selling more tickets. He's, yeah. you know, he's selling, I, I think the tickets went from a hundred bucks to four hundred and fifty. So and then now all of a sudden, all the Will Smith movies are up on Netflix and Amazon and all kind of stuff. And I'm like, oh, wow. OK, you can see how if they if they even if he took the smack in real life, sort of like in wrestling. Right. In wrestling, people get smacked up for money all day long, all day mm -hmm. long. They're taking them, you know, and it, it's to sell more tickets. Right. It's to sell more tickets. It's sort of like how do they say like real life? Uh, uh, art imitating life and then vice versa. So if you look at it that way, you can't really, you can't really say for certain, oh, no, 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 he got smacked because he said, no, it was, a, it, was a, it was a cheap joke, but it definitely wasn't worth a smack, right? I've, I've heard dudes, I've heard dudes in the street say worst thing about somebody's mama, you know, and not get smacked up like where I'm from. So, you know, I, I don't know. I, you know, my woman believes that it was contrived. She doesn't believe anything that happens in Hollywood is real. <laughs> so I gotta, I gotta, I gotta side with her. I gotta side with her that a percentage of me believes that it was some, you know, not that it was a hoax, but you know, you know, a hoax means that it didn't, you know, it did really happen. But what, what, what was the essence of it really happening? Was it, yo, uh, we can both benefit if this goes down, like blah blah. You understand what I mean? Like, yeah. uh, and again, even Chris Rock's brother selling more tickets. Like, this is how powerful these two men are. Mm -hmm. You know, exactly. So, 
uh, uh, you know, if you see, if, if we see a reality show, if we see a reality show be, based on this, know that this, that this shit was, you know, this was <laughs> something that they, that they, that they put together. A hundred percent. And even, 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 um, first of all, the joke was like we say back in the Island, it was a, it was a, it was a strawberry joke. It was, it was, it wasn't even a, a joke that could even get any, shouldn't get anybody mad. And the second thing also is what just Mark just said, it was, it's so weird. It's so uh, convenient that right after the Oscars, Chris Rock w- was about to start his, his tour. Right. And, and now, and, and from 100, it went to four or $500 a ticket. So it's right. hard. It's hard to believe. It's hard to believe because you know yeah. that, that's, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the way things yeah. move. Yeah, when you peel it back, sort of like an onion, you go, "Wait a minute, come mm. on!" Mm. Like I said, if you go on Netflix or whatever, you see a Hancock is on. You know, Netflix. <laughs> that movie. That movie should not be in any annals of any <laughs> any good movie. Like Hancock, what? you put Hancock back on. Like Mark, all what? the films. Like, <laughs> Hancock is not- the one you put back on Netflix. <laughs> On Netflix, is a top ten, top ten, one of the top yeah, ten movies. Yeah, top ten in the now. U.S. You're like top <laughs> ten in the U.S. <laughs> in whose house is this a top? <laughs> I, it's better than the other one with the with the aliens, bright, whatever it's called. Um, oh no, I that said, one's back there. That one's on. No, there. that one's the back. That one's on. The, uh, <laughs> uh, you know. You're like, hold on a second, Gemini Man is on? Like, nobody saw Gemini Man. Nobody. Why is this on? <laughs> and at least come back with the, with, the, with something else. So, Mark, you, you had just mentioned that you're from the Bronx. So yes, um, tell us a little bit about that, man. What, what part of the Bronx you're from? Uh, what hood you represented or you used to represent? You know where you're from? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will always be Castle Hill, oh, you know, man. the Castle Hill section. Uh, oh, you know, we rep in the bigger in the bigger picture. We rep Soundview. Um, again, you know, home of KRS-One, nice. um, CL Smooth, you know, just a bunch of dudes that, uh, that, that have big dreams of, you know, of coming out of our, you know, our homegrown sort of hip hop culture, uh, break dance, you know, uh, that, that was the era from which I was birthed, you know what I mean? The era where we used to watch people break dance and go, I could do that. And then we would go g- grab a box and open it up and try the same moves, you know? Um, so, you know, the the Bronx, although, it, you know, it, it's weird how you get older and you realize that it's where I'm from, but it's not where I'm going, you know? And so the sky's the limit and where I live doesn't, you know, doesn't show the world who I am. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, I'm a, I'm a compilation of the good and the bad that I've experienced, you know, from getting robbed every week, you know, everywhere we went uh, to fighting my way out of, you know, out of the hood and, you know, sort of progressing little by little by little, you know, again, the Bronx is just where my story begins. But it's not necessarily where my story ends, you know, like, and I, and I take pride in that. Mark, you know what? That was so well said because a lot of people, they wear where they come from. And it's like, there's no, um, there's not a lot of involvement. It should, it should be a compilation. Like you said, it's part of you, but it doesn't, it's not the end of all of you, yep. you know? So I, I like the way you just put that. And I'm going to, I'm definitely going to remember that. It was really nice. So thank you. Let's start with comedy, brother. How how do you get started, man? And I, yeah, man, I got to tell you, you're funny as fuck, man. You're funny. You know, you know how I know you're funny. Yo, this is this is the test of how you can tell somebody's funny. I'm in bed, right? Late at night. It's not freaky, Mark. Don't get scared. I'm in bed, and, and I fucking. And hear... I'm touching myself. <laughs> oh my god! Mark, <laughs> Where is this going? Where is this going? No, this... Entonces, entonces, eh, my pantalones start to grow in a very weird manner. <laughs> what? No, so I, I'm in bed. It's about twelve thirty at night, and I'm trying to go to sleep, and I hear giggling. It's my freaking wife. She's next to me. And she's just cackling, laughing, laughing. I said, what the fuck are you doing? Oh, I'm watching TikTok. I'm watching this guy. And I'm like, all right. 
Hour later, she's still laughing. She she went on one of your freaking vines and saw every video you did. <laughs> laughing. Laugh. I said, yo, this guy right here, he's good. And mind you, yeah. we've seen you at the Mark Anthony concerts like maybe three or four times because we went yeah. to about 15 concerts. And you were yeah. always killing there. And that's how, at that point, I said, Mark is freaking good. When you can make a woman laugh like that, yo, you're good. You're real yeah. good. Yeah, but, I always say my, my comedy is good for the soul, but it's also soul bearing. Like I make yeah. I, th I think now I make people laugh because we connect on like yeah. a bunch of different levels. And I know I connect with the women because, you know, uh, I, I've experienced the wrath of every level of woman. You know what I mean? So whether it's the nosy side, the, the gangster side, and, and I love being on stage and portraying you know, the female voice, you know, yeah. and I feel like I All give it its you. justice. I give it its justice, <laughs> but I feel like it's still a, they realize that I'm a character of, of their inner, their, because a lot of, you know, what's funny is like Latinas are like, yo, that's me. That's me. You know? and, <laughs> yes, yes. And, and then, yeah. And you see white, so a lot of times the white women are like, like, I don't do that, but I want to, like, they want to, like, they want it, you know? They're like, but I don't want to lose my house. I don't want to lose my house. Like, they're like, you know, but, and so they're more pocketed. They're more like undercover gangsters. Whereas, you know, Latinas are like, no, pff, I smacked them yeah. yesterday for looking at bitches TikTok. You know, you're like, Dang. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but so how did it all start for you? You know, like, uh, when did you get into comedy? How did it happen? And, you know, at what point did you think to yourself, you know, I want to pursue this full time? What, what, was it after you got robbed about 17 times? Yeah, yeah, it's not, yeah. Well, well, this is the thing, comedy, <laughs> my comedy was born, my comedy was born in the Bronx as a defense mechanism to the, the snapping, right? The snapping mm -hmm. that was going on back and forth used to turn into slap boxing and then that turned into just straight fighting yeah you know uh so we had a progression in my in my neighborhood that started out with the words and so i realized um that my words were getting me into a whole lot of trouble mm -hmm. because i was i was that dude that was writing snaps at night at home because i didn't want to lose so that meant that i was sharpening a blade right of my words um, and it, it didn't always fare well. Like, you know, the, the, the coge galleta that I was in the neighborhood, uh, because of, because of how sharp my <laughs> tongue was, um, yeah, yeah. You know, you, you, you had to take, you had to take it, you know what I mean? It was like, it was rough. So it, it, it like, I don't know, it, it evolved, you know, it evolved into when we, we got older. Me and, the, me and the guys in my neighborhood, we got older. They realized that I had a talent. You know, I would go to the movies and I would recite everything that happened in the movies. I would watch Saturday Night Live. I would recite everything that happened on Saturday Night Live. And they started to almost look at me like, how are you doing that? How did you watch that one time and memorize, you know, not only what Eddie Murphy said, but what the girl said, this guy said, that guy. I, re I would remember the entire dialogue watching it one time only. And so it, it just continued to evolve. It just continued to evolve. I mean, I started comedy when I was 27. I, I started a, a writing course because I was, you know, I felt like I knew how to write. I just didn't know how to write funny. And then, I, and then it just, like I said, it just took off. I did my first show at 27. It was my first show that I had ever done. I took a comedy workshop and they offered a, offered a, you know, a moment on stage, five minutes on stage at the end of the workshop of which half the class didn't take. And I, and I decided, all right, I'm gonna do it. I'll give it a shot. And I went on stage and I never looked back. That's over 20 years ago. Oh, I'm blessed. Yeah, oh, February, blessed. February, May 20 years, February 15th. That was the day that I first took stage over 20 years ago. So that's crazy, man. It's crazy to me, the journey, right? Because you, you, you find that it's a journey of, uh, a, it's a journey of laughter in the beginning. And then it becomes a journey of soul. You know, mm -hmm. once you find your funny, then then the, the question is to become great at this. How much of your soul are you willing to bear for the sake of humor, for the sake of bringing the laughter? So, so it's a constant challenge of how deep are you willing to go? And, and you realize that because uh, like Richard Pryor in the very beginning, he was a clean comedian. 
He was doing mm-hmm. a lot of the, you know, how do you say in Spanish, we called it a charlatan, like he was just a, 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 a young black smiley face, you know, he just wanted to hear the laughs and then the laughs become secondary to being honest with the audience, to being more open with them, right? So the laughter becomes second, but once they unite, that's when that's when you become a problem. Like Sebastian Maniscalco, you know, Joe Coy, Angela Johnson. When you start to really embrace that comedy is the within, you just become a problem. You just you know the, because the earth the earth can't deny you your honesty, your true self, your storyline. Exactly. You know, and, I, and that's why I, I I feel like. Like the George Carlin's who wrote, he wrote everything that he was, you know, thinking, even religion and things where people go, you don't talk about that. George Carlin was like, why not? You know, why not? Because some people are going to get it. They're going to get it. That I'm not saying it didn't exist. I'm just saying that, eh, you know, (laughs) and uh, exactly. Yeah. And it, it it just, it's all like, if you really fit in the ball, you know, the guys who fit in that ball, deserve it right they deserve it whether you're a bernie mac fan or whatever it is who you whoever you're a fan of the bill burrs of the world the dave Chappelle's, you go they all fit in this ball because they went from money to something else it, it just it's just something else you know the the, the mm-hmm. willingness to bear a soul on stage in front of strangers is so Priceless. like it's so profound to me as the person who is still finding his way, like after 20 years, yeah. you know, I feel like Luke Skywalker, you know, there because there's, yeah, because it's funny because there's Obi-Wan and then there's Yoda, but to get to Yoda status, you know, yeah, it's like, yo, what do I have to do, you know? Why am I still Skywalker? <laughs> but, <you know? laughs> but it's still, but I'm still, I'm still grateful for the process. Right. And that's Absolutely. I think that's the beautiful thing about stand up comedy is the more I give to it, the more it gives me back. But not like what you think. It's not a it's not a fancy car or money or whatever. It's there's something about how I walk the earth, knowing that I live honestly. Most people, most people put, on, you know, live in their shell comfortably. Mm-hmm. You know, they go to work and they see people. Hi. Hi, John. How are you, John? You know, then they. <laughs> Right. Then when they go home, they're, they're, that's when they're their true selves. Right. When I go to work, that's when I am my truest self. You know, when I get on stage, I'm in front of all these people who I've no known from it. You know, I am my truest self. It's like it is a crazy, crazy thing, but it's the most beautiful thing. It's the most poetic part of doing stand up. And I guess that's why people feel so connected to you because you're not you're not just a comedian. It's like, well, that guy's an extension of my family because he's telling me all these stories that are hitting home and and that they resonate with me. Um, but you just you just named you reeled off a couple of big giants in the comedy game. Who is who are some of the folks that were influential on your comedy early on? Um, see, there's a there's two parts to that question because. Okay, so I came up in the New York comedy scene when some of the greats were doing were doing stand up. Right. So the people that influenced me as a young just as a young person that made me laugh and made me want to be like them. Number one is the obvious. I grew up when Eddie Murphy was in his 20s and he was on everything. Yeah. You know, he was on everything. He was on Saturday Night Live. He was in all the movies. He was on Johnny Carson. He was, on, you know, the man. The man plagued us. He plagued us with laughter. And a lot of people just forget who Eddie Murphy is, you know, how funny that man, that man is. And so I give like all the props. And even though he was born of a Richard Pryor, I didn't get to watch Richard Pryor because I, you know, Richard Pryor was only in the movies at that time. You know, he was only they would only show him like, you know, in sort of quietly in places that wanted to pay to see him. They could see him. Whereas Eddie Murphy. He was on TV like yeah. he was on TV being as uh, how do you say he was funny, but also as talented. Right. So Eddie, Eddie would be down as number one. But I mean, um, Billy Crystal was big for me really? when I was coming up. Robin Williams was on television. Yeah. Also, he was a stand up comic. But I remember Mark and Mindy, you know, yeah. uh, uh, John Ritter, you know, even John though not too. a stand up comic per se. 
you know, John Ritter was everything to me, man. I watched, you know, I laugh. I probably laughed till I peed the first time watching Three's Company, you know, mm-hmm. yeah, and watching was- the talent that was John Ritter. And so uh, Jerry Lewis, you know, my grandmother used to used to watch all the Jerry Lewis movies. I swear to God, people, most people think you laugh when you watch Jerry Lewis. I just can't believe he was so talented. Yeah. It's me like that. Look. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It still holds I'm still up, a too. Fan. I'm still it still a holds fan up. Yeah. Abbott and Costello. Yeah, when I look for my funny, I watch Abbott and Costello. When I look yeah. for my for my the birth of my humor, I look, I watch a Jerry Lewis movie and I'm just like, how did they do this? How did they allow this guy to just run amok in yeah. front of the camera? <laughs> <laughs> you know? um, so there's like so many layers. And then and then as I became, and you know, then I became a, co- a comedian and started to hear names uh, like George Lopez a Latino like me. And, uh, you know, and I just was like, oh, wow, I want to be like that. I want to be a storyteller like that because I have, because George is so Mexican in his, in his style, his, his, his style isn't Mexican, but his Mexicanness, you know, it just oozes into his style. Right. And man, I love yeah, I love, you know, I fell in love with George many, many, many years ago. Now he's a good friend of mine. I can't believe it. But George is like, you know, like like even Fluffy. I wasn't I wasn't a big fan of Fluffy until I started to work with him. And then I was like, man, this dude is a monster. He is. He is. You know, this dude, this dude really, he he engages an audience almost like no other comedian out there. He's just so engaging. And Mark, he's um, clean. That's what's crazy. And then clean. Yeah. Yeah. He's just a, so th- these were like little bits of bits of nuggets, you know, and then when you get a look like I got in my teens, I was watching George Carlin for just like profoundness. I was just like, why? Why am I not laughing? Why am I? Why is my jaw dropped? Is somebody is he was smart? You know, Super, Carlin, yeah. Carlin was like a savant. You know, he knew facts. He knew he knew things most people don't care to know. So he made that a part of his standup, which is like still to me, one of those things that I have to challenge myself to do. Be factual. You know, if, if I'm going to bring something up, you know, tell a fact inside of the embellishments of inside of the humor. You know, so many, so many little things like that, you know, uh, uh, kind of helped me mature the, the stand up, the stand up comedy side, you know, but, um, you know, Chris Rock. I meant to, to think that I've worked with Chris and, and I've and I've sat back and had to watch him work is just like, again, that's watching the OB1, you know, like I yeah. got to I got to take the stage for 10 minutes and then sit back and watch this dude just go on and annihilate an audience with cerebral, smart, well written, you know, Jerry Seinfeld. Like I, I have such a love and affection for everyone that does this. But I would say the the dude that that paved the way that really opened the door for me to make people laugh is Eddie because that's who I was that's who I was emulating. Every mm-hmm. time I went to hang out with my friends, I was doing you know, <laughs> <laughs> and I was outside trying to trying to recreate you know James Brown trying to re- the way Eddie did it you know and, yeah. and when Eddie did a white dude I did it like Eddie you know it was hilarious you know it was funny you know, everybody was like yo Mark yo you do that shit man it's funny yo. Like, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, I was funny because Eddie Murphy did something funny like I was uh, doing nothing that was my own when I was you know 15 years old I was doing everything that Eddie did you know yeah. <laughs> it's funny not, not taking but, nothing not taking nothing off uh, I'm sorry Luke Okay. Not taking nothing away from Richard Pryor because we know he, he was he was phenomenal. But I think for our era, Eddie Eddie is the goat. Like yeah. I remember yeah. watching watching uh, when I first raw? heard. I didn't watch, uh, not raw, delirious. Okay, delirious. delirious. You know what? Mark hit the nail right on the head. What makes it connect and funny is that it's the facts behind it. You know how many times we were running be- after the the the, the, the ice cream truck. And there was always one kid that couldn't buy the ice cream, and then we cruel motherfuckers. You got no ice. That <laughs> happened. That fucking yeah. happened. Yeah. And, yeah. and then you would drop your ice cream in the door. Oh, you got that. That's fucking hilarious shit, bro. Yeah. Right, so I know yeah. he's the go for us. I, I, I'm with yeah. Mark on this one. Like yeah. you know, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yelling up to the window. Mami, mandame, mandame, chavo, que, que, que viene el ice cream. And then mommy was pulling down. You know, my, my grandmother would put money, change in a in an aluminum foil. Oh, yes. She would put it in a little piece of aluminum foil. That shit was like a missile coming from the fifth floor. That shit hit you on the hand. You were like, I, I, you didn't care. You grabbed you it, you were running out. Oh, the Went to the ice cream truck with your hair like that, burning from the aluminum foil. That thing. That shit was still sizzling. Look, you had a, you had a dent. Yo, you had a dent in your hand from the aluminum foil. You was like that. Yo, let me get the little ice cream foam. Uh, with, with rainbow. That shit thing. <laughs> Those are those are oh, battle shit. scars. Yo, those are battle scars for Mr. Soft, bro. Hey, Mark, you, you um I, you actually kind of led me to my next question. Uh George Lopez, he, he he's our iconic uh comedian. I actually got tickets from him in May, but I see that you partnered with him and you guys are working on a sitcom. Can you tell us about that project, how it came about and how that relationship developed between you two guys? Yeah, well, uh, that project was uh, on the... Okay, so let, let me just digress slightly. That project was in the works. It no longer is in the works because oh, we... Ah. George and I... Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you why. But but that doesn't mean that... That doesn't mean that it's never going to happen. We just... Oh. we You know, I wrote a show, right? I wrote a show based on my life. And at the time, George's right-hand person in his production company, Leslie Smalls, um, saw me doing a set uh, for a TV show called Comedy.TV. It plays all over, you know, it's one of those TV shows that plays um, in different markets, like like Comics Unleashed. It's like one o'clock okay. in the morning. Okay. On on like, on the, the country music channel when there's nothing else to play. They, you know, Byron Allen has sold all these different specials. So I did a special for them and uh, George Lopez, you know, like I said, his right hand person looking uh, a scout for him, saw me uh, do my set. I got a standing ovation on a part of my joke where I say no words. I, I was killing. And then I do a part of a joke where I say women check your phone when you fall asleep. And then I then did the act out of men sleeping and a woman slithering out of the bed little by little, <laughs> you know, uh, as she goes to check your phone like a ninja. Um, <laughs> And the audience, I said no words during that part of the joke. I'm just slithering little by little by little by little by little. And I'm acting it out, acting it out. And I, I get up and I go, thank you guys so much. I'm Mark Vieira. The place just stands up. Like they just have, have, they're just hysterical laughing. Leslie comes to me and she goes, you are a walking TV show. So let's do it. Okay. And uh, and she said, send me, send me, you know, send me all the particulars. I want to know what this show would be like. Who's it about? Blah, blah. So I, I wound up sending, working with her. And like about a week later, because I'm Johnny on the spot, I can write. I'm not I'm not a dumb guy. I wrote the, the what's called a treatment. I send it to Leslie and then she goes, OK, um, let's let's get George on on. a." At that time, it was it wasn't Zoom. It was something else. Um, whatever the, the thing was at the time, the conference call okay. and, you know, I'm I'm looking like this at Leslie in one screen, George in the other screen, and my manager's in the other screen. And George takes the, the floor and he goes, Mark, I read your treatment. Um, you are the next me. I swear to God, you have to see my... I got up, I put my, my camera on pause. I went in the living room and I threw myself on the floor like a, like a little girl being asked out on a first date. Mm -hmm. Like I was... That's amazing. I just couldn't believe that George said that. And then he goes, you are fucking hilarious. And your story needs to be told. You know, every time America thinks of Latinos, they think of Mexican American experience. But there's a Caribbean, there's a Caribbean uh, Latino that is underserved. And we're going to tell your story. And so we started the project from there forward. We got a, a head writer. We wrote the script. We sold the show to Warner Brothers, which is the same production company as the George Lopez show. Um, the own, now, now here's where it gets sticky. Just because you're writing a show, you sold a show, which I made some money. Doesn't mean your show goes on air. There are, wow. to get on air, you basically have to, you know, cut off a limb. You know, it, it's almost like, like Russian roulette, uh, not Russian, like roulette, you know, it just, your number has to hit the right peg. 
And my number just didn't hit the right peg because I was going up against about four other shows. So when they put my show, you know, on the table with all the executives, everybody has to decide, is this a show that, you know, remember the TV shows, especially on television, not on Netflix, the TV shows only get on air if the sponsors approve. Mm -hmm. So you have to get like a Johnson and Johnson, Coca-Cola, McDonald's to say, oh, yeah, 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 we want to. You know, we will definitely sponsor this show. The shows, listen, the, the, the TV networks, they don't give a shit about what show was on. They care who the sponsors want to, the you know, because it's about money. Exactly. exactly. So because sponsors are the ones paying for the commercials in between, right? And that's how you get paid. That's where the millions come in from. The yeah. millions come in from the sponsorships. And you only have 22 minutes to tell your story. So against me was a, a comedian named Dov, David Dov, very, very funny. Another female funny chick named Mindy Colling. She's from the show The Office. And she winds up oh, going the up. India, the India chick. Indian chick. Yeah. So they were looking for a diverse show, right? So the Latin and blah, blah. So I knew that the other dude, they, Dov, uh, D-O-V is his name, Dov Davidov. I knew that he wasn't going to make it because they weren't looking for a white show, you know? So it was basically between me and Mindy Colling. And Mindy Colling, the only difference between her and I, number one, my show was better than hers. But she had celebrity already. She had already mm -hmm. been on The Office. Office. She had already been on a couple of projects where she was already in a, in a bit of the, of the uh, eyes of the public. So it was sort of like an unknown, like a rocky you know, situation where... I was the underdog in that in that scenario. I was the underdog. The difference was my show had heart and soul and her show was about an Indian girl getting dick. And <laughs> I don't know how I don't know how that show beat me. I got to be honest. It was a horrible, horrible show, but it had a good lead, which was her. Plus, she was as brown as they come. And I look white. I, I get it. Why Fox, you know, Fox had a big undertaking. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, so I sold the show to Warner Brothers. I sold the show to Fox. We wrote several episodes. So we, you know, me and George, we had to work a lot together. So we wound up creating this incredible uh, kinship between he and I, and we became friends. And there was no love lost at the show because it had nothing to do with me or George. Gotcha. You had nothing to do with me or George. Like that is the shit that happens in Hollywood. You know, Dave Chappelle, I think, wrote 16 pilots before anything ever became of his name. You know, this is what happens. Kevin Hart, yeah. Dio Hughley, Chris Rock, they all had pilots that didn't do shit. This is what happens. You know, this is called the, the Hollywood process. You, yeah. you got to keep writing. You got to keep creating. You got to be, this is the most important part. You got to be relevant. You know, the relevant part becomes the, the high thing in Hollywood. You know, okay, you're telling a story, but what's relevant about it? You know, why does America need you? The difference is now that we have social media, they don't have to test your pilot anymore like they used to. You know, they could just go, do you have any episodes of this? And you go, yeah, I, I already I did it. I did a couple of quick snippets and they're on my my TikTok and it has 80 million views. And they're like, all right, well, you need a show. That's it. You know? Exactly. Wow. Yeah. Not only that, but I can do an episodic show with a little bit more freedom on Netflix. Yeah. Which is what which is honestly where I would rather be. You know, I'd rather be on like a Netflix where you have a little bit of, of creative freedom, whereas the network says, well, the FCC says a woman doesn't say bitch. And that's what happens. You that's know, crazy. a guy can say bitch. A woman can't because that, you know, because that makes a woman look evil and they don't, you know, do so it's many crazy. rules to the game. Wow. You know, so crazy. many rules to the game. They're playing 1950s, you know, where a woman doesn't. <laughs> You know, she's there, but she doesn't have a prominent role, so yeah. to speak. No, but listen, to the, the mere fact that you got to work with George, uh, the praise that he gave you. I mean, that's just, you know, that's just more fuel for you to keep on pushing forward. And and we're, we're as fans, we're glad to hear that. And we can only anticipate what's in the future for you. Um, yeah. We're, we're, we're kind of against the clock. I wanted to because I we have fans that are big fans of Mark Anthony. Yes. Tell us about that experience. I mean, you you were you were pretty much a rock star for the time you were on tour with him. So tell us how that went uh, and any crazy stories that you could share. Um. Well, this is the thing. So Mark is very to himself. You know, he's not like he's not what you think when you're on tour with him and he's partying with you and you're dancing salsa with him in the back. Um, <laughs> very, 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 
he's very work oriented. You know, he has a show to do. The show is two hours and I'm about 30 minutes of his show. So the, the experience, the highlight of it was, you know, I would come out to a dry ass crowd. They just got to their seats at the, you know, American Airlines Arena in Miami, you know, and here I am. I'm the first thing that they see at a concert. They paid well over a hundred dollars to see. So I, I took that very seriously and, you know, had to find my way how to how to entertain 27, 30,000 people at a time um, while I am not important to them. They didn't pay to see me. You know, yeah. they paid to hear, you know, <laughs> you know, all, all of Mark's <laughs> greatest hits. <laughs> uh, you know, they, they're like, yo, sing preciosa, comedian. Like, you know, <laughs> you, but you, what happens is that they realize, especially if you're funny, that you're funny and they yeah. and that you be you you deserve to be listened to. And I feel like that was the, you know that was the process with that for me is that as now, now listen, once you're done with stand up, I had the best seat in the house. I'm watching Mark from 10 feet away from backstage awesome. and I'm dancing. I'm singing every lyric. I see him with no shirt, no shoes, sweating. And I, again, I just realized that this is, listen, man, as much as I want to say that's funny and blah, blah, and there's a heart and soul there's the most important part is the performance. You know, the most important 100%. part of what I do is that I gear up to perform for the audience, that I never take a night off because a Mark Anthony would never do that. You know, uh, uh, a Gabriel Iglesias would never do that, never. So I make sure that before I go on stage that I am John Ritter, Mark Anthony, Fluff, you know, I am taking all of those experiences and highlighting the fact that the audience save their money, whether it's $30 ticket, $10 ticket, whatever it is, they paying money to see me. So my experience with Mark taught me that whatever, if you have a headache, you better take three Tylenols and go get it because that audience, man, they've been, some people wait months to see me. Some people drive, I do a show in Jersey. They drive from Virginia. They wow. drive down from Connecticut. And I'm just like, damn, you in the car for three and a half hours? To watch me do an hour, well, I better make this hour worthwhile, you know, Absolutely. because right, right, we're taking time from our kids, from our lives. They, they want to spend an hour with me. Then I got to make it worthwhile. I got to make that shit memorable. You know, it, it, it's so important to me. You know, Mark doesn't do songs he wrote on the way in. He knows that people want to hear you know, eso maldito celo. Like, they, they want to hear <laughs> You know what I mean? You, you know, they don't, they're not there to hear, you know, all right, everybody, I wrote this song on the way in, it's called La Chula Pepa, and they're like, oh, no, <laughs> no, 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 si preciosa, preciosa, right? we si preciosa. Gonna, he did in 96, and he's like, that shit is from 96, bro. <laughs> yeah. but, but what happens is, is what I'm trying to get at is that people connect to music, right? Yeah. There's a song that here that's connected i call it connective tissue it's like it's something that immediately when you hear it is grabbing you and i feel like a lot of the jokes that you hear that your wife is laughing at in some respects you know maybe that joke has connective tissue to her you know where she's like oh my god the one he does about bustelo i remember <laughs> i used to go to mommy's house and mommy would be like Ay, un café antes yeah. que te vaya and you're like mommy you can't drink the coffee because I got an hour and a half and, and I gotta, I'm going to have to shit. I don't want to drink, you know. There's, so even, even as silly as that may sound, Bustelo for us is a, it's connected. It connects you and me because I don't drink, I don't drink Folgers, bro. Like, yeah. you understand what I mean? Like, Absolutely. I, it's, but when, I, when I say Bustelo, it's almost like you could smell it. Like, you, yep. I say Bustelo and I swear you go like that, look. <laughs> It's After so we go here, I'm gonna have to go oh drink the guy. I'm gonna go drink some right? coffee. I'm going to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, so it's hey. almost, it's almost in, in the dynamic. It's almost the same, you know. Where Mark sings that song, I do that that joke. You know that yeah. people love. They just love it. So uh, it, it just taught me to to be the the a professional and a performer when I hit the stage. Now, when I'm off stage and you want to talk to me, bro, it's like this. 
Yeah. You know, it's like this. I'm, I'm very general. I'm very cool. If you want to talk, yo, did you see the Golden State? I'm very <laughs> like that. But when it comes to when I get on stage, bro, I it, there's something happens where the knob turns to 10 because I don't know how to do eight or seven or I'm 10, you know? That's, yeah, that's awesome, and, bro. That's and awesome. I definitely and that definitely comes across in your work. You are a true professional when you're up there. Hey, Mark, it's been a hold true, up, hold up, hold it, up, hold up, hold up, hold up, wait, wait, hold Chris, up. Chris, because I don't want it to get cut off. All Mark, right, so go ahead. it's been a true, true delight <laughs> to have you on. Say, Chris, you need to lose weight. <laughs> yo, yo, why you gotta take shots? Don't fat shame me. <laughs> no, 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 wait. No, no, Chris, Mark, you need to come I'm to the gym to... with me, bro. <laughs> Oh, yo, yo, no, yo, listen, Mark. If you don't stop, you look like a stunt double for The Rock. Yo, you, yo, you, yo. I'm watching, I'm watching the gym videos. I said, this guy doesn't want to be a comedian. The boys, he's gonna go to WWF, man. He's jacked yo, up. They, they, they call me the little pebble, bro. <laughs> hey, Mark, man, it was a true delight, brother. Thank you, man. Thank you, thank so, you, thank you so much, Mark. Thank Appreciate you so much, y'all, man. Thank you for hey, having. God me. bless and, and continue success, man. Man, I need you guys, all right? Yeah, you got it, man. Be good. God bless. Right. Thank you.